Welcome to Inside the Middle East Q&A series at the Middle East Initiative. My name is Ali Gökpınar and I am an associate editor for the Harvard Journal of Middle Eastern Politics and Policy. Today we are joined by Ambassador Nabila Al Mullah, former ambassador of the state of Kuwait. Ambassador Al Mullah, thank you for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. So let me cut to the chase. Everybody is curious about the current state of affairs in the Middle East. So where is the Middle East regional balance heading? Depends what you call the Middle East as well. You know, for some time they even included Afghanistan as part of the Middle East. And sometimes they even cut off, you know, uh, uh, for example, some of the African countries like Sudan and Djibouti from the Middle East. Sure. But now the Middle East, where is it heading? Where is the ho whole world heading? Mm -hmm. I think you'll find lots of changes, you know, shifting sands all over in Europe, for example, with their financial crisis. And now also with the Crimea crisis, the question of politics. I think, you know, one has to be very judicious in addressing any issue concerning a region because the region has no boundaries. Yeah. What's happening in Crimea affects us. What's happening with the uh, uh, nuclear program in Iran affects the rest of the world. So no region is immune from being affecting or being affected by the other. I see that. So what alliances or dynamics will shape the next five years in the Arab and Gulf Middle East? I believe basically it is within. It's every country depending on its own stability that will decide the greater concentric circle, how it will go about uh, these alliances. And then besides that, the regional one, the local, then the regional one, and third are the external ones. And our relations as a region, if you want to zoom on the Gulf countries, for example, the GCC, the six countries, we are affecting and being affected by what is happening in the countries going through these upheavals, what change of governments and whatnot. We are also affected by what is happening at our doorstep with the rapprochement between the West or the big countries and Iran, settlement of its nuclear program. We are also affected by the relationship, the overall relationship strategically between the United States and the Russian Federation. Where is this leading to? It's not a very happy circumstances. It's not a happy backdrop to what we would like to see, keeping in mind that we are trying our best to resolve the Syrian crisis. So if there is some kind of animosity between the two bigger players on the scene, of course that will affect other issues. Do you think the GCC will be successful in helping Syria uh, resolve its conflict? We cannot do it alone. I don't believe so. But we have been instrumental in getting or uh, coalescing all these humanitarian uh, uh, assistance for Syria. It's an intermediary uh, role, but we are, we would really like to see a political solution to it. We held in Kuwait, uh, one was only recently two uh, conferences, international conferences, in order to help uh, to alleviate the uh, humanitarian situation there. I see that. So do you think there is a need for coordination of GCC countries' efforts with regards to the Syrian crisis? Naturally, naturally. There has to be one, but I think the uh, uh, coordination will have to be with the other powers. We cannot do it on our own. We need to have the international community. Basically, we need the Security Council initiative. And as everyone knows, the, there is no move on the Security Council because of uh, the threat or the specter of uh, uh, veto, you know, on uh, any political situation. Uh, we'll have to see if we can find some kind of an inroad into that. Against this backdrop, do you expect any major changes in the Syrian crisis in the next two years? Two years? Ooh. Oh, we have the elections coming up. According to the, uh, uh, the uh, individual agenda of uh, President uh, Assad, 
uh, I don't think <laughs> two years, you know, I think one year we will, we will see a change in the landscape. I see that. Uh, how do you think that the Western countries can aid Gulf countries in dealing with the rise of uh, radical Islamic organizations in the region? This is, um, it's not only the Western countries, it's all over. Even us, as countries of the region, how can we stop this uh, uh, extremist from taking over or having a bigger say, competing with those forces that are really nationalistic and want the best for the countries? Uh, I will go even further in terms of history than this. Western countries, from the start, and we have alerted them to the fact have given refuge to quite a number of these extremists. They will uh, seek asylum or they will seek residency in uh, Western capitals under the pretext that human rights, freedom of expression and whatnot. If you look at the uh, uh, number of cases of people who are being tried now, how did they end up in the United States or in the UK? You know? They give them refuge, they encourage them, and I think, you know, uh, out of the respect for their own values, that is the West, that they gave refuge to them. They never had that kind of open space to practice their own politics and to entrench themselves there. But I think there was somehow a little bit of naivety on the part of the West for taking that initial uh, step. They emboldened them. And they made them, they give them a wider horizon, they give them greater say, and so uh, I think we all have to help each other how we can stem this increase in extremism. But I must say, it's not only extremism, extremism on the part of what they call the jihadists and whatnot. It's not only the Sunnis also, you have the extremists on the part of some Shiites, and you have the extremists on the right even, in uh, uh, some uh, Western countries, they turn to the right, whether it's the Netherlands or in Germany and other places. We have to put a stem to extremism, no matter what color it is. That's so true. So let's go to domestic politics. How do you think the Kuwaiti domestic politics actually influence foreign policy making processes? Domestic policy. You mean our National Assembly? Yes. <laughs> our National Assembly is very vocal. <laughs> <laughs> and it's uh, uh, extremely vibrant. <laughs> you recall one time we had in the program of the High Representative, Catherine Ashton, part of her, uh, she had free time and we invited her to go to the, to the Parliament. And she didn't want to leave. She said, I've never seen, I didn't really believe that <laughs> there is such a vibrant discussion. <laughs> um, it also tends to sometimes uh, to posturing. And I must say that like many parliaments around the world, especially when you have the sessions of the parliament al live on TV, so it's not addressing the issues, but they're addressing the public beyond, <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, on this. Uh, but it's the nature of democracy that you have this kind of, uh, 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 kind of arguments and uh, whatnot. Uh, upmanship within the chamber. <laughs> I see that. So looking back at the evolution of the field and the, the, uh, the developments in the field of diplomacy and co conflict resolution over the course of your career, so what do you think young di diplomats should pay more attention? What uh, your recommendation be? To do what you're doing. <laughs> 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 be involved. You know, it's not only books. Uh, be involved with people, try to know your um, your professors a little bit more. Those who are teaching, you have much more than what the assignments that they are doing there. Uh, engage in the school politics, uh, internship in other places, recommend, you know, have them recommend um, uh, uh, exchange programs and things like that. You'll have to take the best of the best out of your school days. They are fantastic in forming your life afterwards. You know, I've been a beneficiary of something like that, and I recall uh, my professor, and I even describe him as my mentor, 
he introduced me to some fabulous opportunities like the pagosh on disarmament. And I, since then, you know, I've been regularly involved in questions of disarmament and arms control. So try to get the best out of your own teachers. In line with that question, I, I, I'm curious personally, actually, what was the most challenging task that you ever encountered with? And what kind of lesson did you learn from that task? <laughs> there are two. One I will, <laughs> I will call it a, a home affair, opening an embassy. Yeah, I was petrified. How do you open an embassy? And I did not have enough staff. I didn't know the country and things like that. That was in South Africa after apartheid in 94. And I was asked, I was, um, assigned to as ambassador to uh, South Africa and asked to open an embassy to find place, residence and offices and embassy. That was grueling, you know, because people think that being an ambassador is very glamorous <laughs> and all that. I don't know that you go around, you know, polishing the floor and I don't know what, you know, <laughs> driving for delegations. I didn't have a driver. You know. um, and the other um, uh, 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 challenge the um, uh, the challenge I faced most is an attempt to bring divergent views together. And sometimes that takes a lot of work, it takes a lot of energy and homework. Homework in particular to the background of these people. How can I bring you as a young man and another young man and you are totally at odds together to agree on a certain formula and I can present as a result of compromise a consensus forward. This is the biggest challenge any diplomat who has a leadership role faces in, uh, in our work. Uh, it's a lot of groundwork and the result might seem you know, very simple and perhaps at the end maybe they will clap for you, but uh, it takes a lot of thinking, cajoling, you know. So. Thank you so much, Ambassador. That was an enlightening chat. Thank, Thank you. you, and good luck to you. Thank you.